healthy, and I help keep them sharp. Jacket. Good morning. Many conservatives in British Columbia are, I would say, disappointed in the extreme about the very liberal attitude taken towards immigration and refugees by the conservative government of Joseph Clark. Because remember how the Tories talked before the election on the West Coast. And in the studio with me this morning is the, the employment and immigration minister himself, none other than Ron Atke from a celebrated constituency in Toronto. But first, Mr. Atke and I are going to have a happy note with a mutual friend. Hello, oh, Emily. I've heard about you. Oh, and I've heard about your television performance. Oh, you have seen me on the TV? <laughs> no, but I heard about it. Oh. And your reputation is all around British Columbia how in a favorable way. Congratulations. How, how come I? at all. <laughs> you did a magnificent job. Even Mr. Webster was impressed. <laughs> you see, the other day when I, saw, when I saw him, I told him, now, Mr. Jeff Webster, I'm not a troublemaker. I'm looking for peace, happiness, and friendship. Nice to meet you. Wasn't she delightful, Mr. Lovely Atkin? lady. Lovely lady. There are, however, underlying serious questions not only about uh, uh, refugees, but uh, Im about immigration, over which many Canadians are quite worried. And we'll give you these questions immediately after this break. Okay. Ah, good. Mr. Atke is Minister of Employment. He's the guy who's going to tighten up the UIC regulations and immigration for Joe Clark's government. It's impossible to feel any hostility or resentment when you meet the boat people, isn't it? That's right. Uh, it's, a, it's a movement of people which uh, I think is unique to Canada. It's the largest refugee movement we've had come into this country. I made a snide crack about you at the opening of the program that many conservatives are upset with you because you're more liberal than the liberals and seem to be more generous towards refugees and just as generous in other aspects of immigration as the liberals whom you attacked. How do you respond to that simple statement? Well, I don't think you define liberal by being generous and conservative by being sting stingy. I oh. think historically the conservatives have been a, a compassionate and a, and a generous government who have responded to international crises. Uh, keep in mind that the second largest refugee mo movement came in under a conservative government of Mr. Diefenbaker, and that involved the Hungarians. And uh, historically, and I think at the present time, we have a, a capacity for generosity. Uh, coupling it with some protections for Canadians, uh, these refugees are going to make good citizens. They're not going to be on unemployment How insurance. How many or... refugees, though, Mr. Uh, refugees and sponsored and nominated relatives? I'll put it to you very bluntly. There are people who think that uh, we're suffering quite badly now, certainly in Toronto, not too badly on the West Coast, from ethnic indigestion. And there are reasonable people who are not racist who think, when is it all going to stop? Or uh, will we finish up with our immigration coming as high as 60% from the third world and very few from the traditional countries in Europe? What are the exact figures now? Well, right now, in terms of total numbers, we'll have approximately 105,000, 106,000 for 1979 and slightly higher than that for 1980, but in the same ballpark. The largest number of immigrants still comes from the United Kingdom. Second largest number comes from the uh, United States, and the third largest uh, number come from the, the Middle European countries. Is that not a specious answer in that you can't break it down into ethnic groups who come from the United Kingdom? No, you, you can't, because uh, under our law, of course, uh, we're not allowed, and, and nor do we keep statistics or records relating to color or race as, as the situation arises. Is there no concern about that? Is there not a valid concern that with, quote, unlimited immigration by sponsorship and nomination, that there will be an ethnic imbalance? And as McClure, 
of the former moderator of the United Church says, we're begging ethnic indigestion. Well, we don't have unlimited immigration. We have a, a, a pretty clear limit. We had one for last year, and it'll be about the same for this year. The, the other thing you've got to remember is that for the majority of immigrants, there is a, some economic-related criteria. You have to have a job or an offer of a job to get into the country. And that's a basic proposition under our immigration law, unless you're a parent or you're a son or daughter or you're a spouse. In other words, if you're family class. That's correct. And you're single. Yes. There is no limit to the number of people from third world countries who can enter Canada on family class. There is a limit in the sense that the annual projection provides a built-in limit and once we get beyond that then the family class is not likely to allow us to go over that limit. Well let's be quite specific in that. Are you telling me Mr. Atke that, there, that family class stops when you reach your projected quota of immigrants? Because of the time taken in processing, it works out that way. There's not a direct correlation, but it works out that way. There is therefore no limit to the number of people who can come into Canada on family class. In theory, yes. In practice, in, in theory, no. In practice, yes. Now, the point is that Canadians really, I think, uh, the majority of Canadians don't want immigration right now. Would you agree with that? There has historically always been the majority of Canadians who are opposed to any increase in immigration. Is there not, when you look at people like Collins and his myriad of supporters, a much more virulent feeling about that now than before because of the ethnic basis for many of the new immigrants? I sense that the, the resistance now is just another wave that for which there are historical precedents and it isn't any stronger now than it might have been 10 years ago. Even if it's 80 percent against it, you don't think it's an important resentment? Well, the Gallup poll shows it's about 50-50. Local polls show much higher here mm -hmm. in British Columbia. Do you find most resistance comes from the West Coast? I think uh, there's more intensive resistance here because you have higher ethnic and higher, more visible communities in this city, in this province, than in other areas of Canada. One thing I should say, Jack, is that we do have a problem with present immigration levels and the, and the mix, and I indicated that in a report I tabled in Parliament last week. Mm -hmm. That is the balance between family class and independent immigrants. I think, quite frankly, we're squeezing out the independent immigrants, the young people who've got the skills, the education, and the capital to come and make a contribution to this country. And if the Conservative government's going to do anything in this term, we're going to give the independent immigrant a better chance than he, he or she now has. Independent. That is, the person who is willing to come in uh, judged against labor market criteria that will get 50 points and come in and not on the basis of family class, but on the basis of their own particular merit regardless of race, regardless of origin, but can come here and make it on the 50-point system. If they have a job. Yes, well, that's one of because, the... Because, I mean, one of the constant complaints I get from Europeans, especially Britain, is that there's no way that their application will be accepted in Britain for migration to this country. Well, that, that may or may not be true depending on what their skills are. Is there a and rule the that you don't want immigrate, immigrants from Britain? No, there's no rule at all. They're still our largest single source of immigrants. But you don't know the ethnic breakdown. I hate to use the word color. You no, don't know we, that. We, we don't, and we're not permitted under Canadian law to find that out or to and ask that question. But when you've got people going around the country saying that the balance now is 50% third world, 50% white. No, I'm not sure that there's any basis in that. I think that there has been a shift in proportion. And while Great Britain may have been uh, by far and away the largest proportion a few years ago, it has diminished somewhat, but it's still the largest. Now, you did talk earlier on, before you were elected, not you particularly, but Tories by the drove, that the first thing they would do would be cut down family reunification by sponsorship and nomination. You have not touched it, have you? We uh, have indicated in our annual report that we're going to reorient the balance between family class and independent immigrants. And that means that there are going to be more ind independent immigrants allowed in. We still remain committed to the principle of family reunification. That's been in our party policy from time immemorial, and we can continue to be. But nevertheless, the independent immigrant is going to get a better chance under a conservative government. You will concede this, that in the, the, in the sad history of Canada past, apart from overt discrimination going back to the Kamagata Maru, that our immigration system has been, what's the word? has been riddled with fiddles. Right? I, I don't think it's a sad history at all. I think it's an amazing history. We but have, you will concede that our immigration, uh, our, our immigration system has been riddled 
with scandals major and minor. No, I don't accept that. I think immigration has built this country. Many of all of us oh, are immigrants agreed. when it goes me back. Me too. To Who am I to talk about immigrants? Uh, and but, me. Uh, you know enough about well, political history to know all of the problems. There are problems in any country. We've had fewer problems proportionally than most of the countries of the Western world. Immigration has built this country and made it what it is today. And with a declining birth rate, it remains important as a source of population growth. Jack, keep in mind we lose 75,000 people in this country who leave Canada. Now, how are you going to offset that? Not by the birth rate, because it's going down. You know that, and I know that. The well, way you're going to uh, <laughs> the, the way you're going to offset that is through immigration. And let's make sure we get the very best immigrants. That remains the challenge. Last year, I had an official of what is now your department on this program telling my report to Brian Coxford that they could do very little to stop a racket of twenty million dollars a year out of British Columbia on phony claims for dependence in third world countries. Have you stopped that yet? You watch us. We will stop it. It's, it's a difficult process, but we've already taken some, stop, uh, some steps to eliminate some of the problems. And as I said, we're going to reorient that balance and give the in independent immigrant a chance. But you're not going to cut down family class. No, we're going to remain committed to the principle of family reunification, and that remains very important, that you can bring your parents or you can bring your son or daughter or your wife legitimately here. If they're not over 21, and if they're not married, and that's if they have a job... No, we won't require the job requirement on family class. That's, but you'll allow married people under 21 to come, will you? If it's a legitimate marriage, yes. You're not no, I, I'm talking moment. about a Canadian uh, or, or permanent yeah. resident marrying a, a, a would-be immigrant. You will concede, Mr. Atke, though, that it's stories such as I do as a reporter from time to time about the $20 million racket and phony money orders that raises the specter of ethnic indigestion. Well, I, I you don't... haven't really wiped that out the, in any the way, The $20 shape million dollar racket, I don't... That's B.C. alone. Uh, if, if, if such a racket exists, we're going to take step, uh, steps to, to stamp it out. Don't you concede uh, that such a racket exists? You get various reports, and I've had Your reports officials. from my officials, and, and I don't have anybody telling me that there's any $20 million racket as such. There are some problems in isolated areas of corruption, of fraud, and we're seeking to deal with those expeditiously. You watch us. Yeah, but you've been in power, what, six months? No, since June 4th. Do you want to see the film clip I did with your official telling us about the $20 million racket? Sure, if you got it. I won't show it now, but you can have it. Okay. Webster and Mr. Ron Atke, Minister of Employment and Immigration, after the break. You guaranteed my... I'd like just to get the boat people straight for the record. This year, bringing in how many? Uh, in the next two years, about 50,000. And that will mean this year, in total, about 23,000. 23,000. 1979. That's all? Yeah. That's one for one. One for one. Uh, what do you mean, on the matching principle? Yeah. Well, no, the, 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 the private sponsorships are going along so well. We've got about 22,000 private sponsorships signed up. And a lot of those people aren't here yet. So we're seeking first to fill the private sponsorship demand. After that's filled, then the government-sponsored refugees under the matching principle will be met. So the majority coming in in 79 are the private sponsorships that are looked after by groups of five or more Canadians who put up some money and signed a contract for up to a year. You've got to give them credit. This is the first time there's been a specific or responsible sponsorship for a number of immigrants. Well, it's the most amazing uh, That's 23,000, is that right? That's right. And I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the Canadian people and the people in British Columbia, where you're over 3,000 sponsorships alone. Total immigration this year, did you say 108, 109,000? About, uh, about 105, 106,000. You were quoted the other day at 140. No. 105, 106,000. That's for 1979. It'll work out about that. And just to, so I know in future when I'm talking to liberals who will now attack your policy perhaps, you're going to strengthen the independent immigrant from all parts of the world. That's correct. Make it easier for independent immigrants of the right trade. The people who've got the skills and the capital and the education to make a contribution. You're going to loosen up the family class to some extent. No, we're not going to loosen it up. We'll just uh, maintain the principle of family reunification. Yeah, but you're going to allow married ones under 21 to come in. That's a loosening up. Well, okay. And uh, you, you, you say that we will not have the multiplier effect which was feared, in fact, which was demonstrated in this town from some communities of anything from 8 to 12 per immigrant. Certainly won't be the case, Jack, in the, with the boat people because 
Two things you've got to keep in mind. A great many of their relatives have drowned in the sea. And it's a cruel hoax to suggest that there's a multiplier of any greater than one to one or even less than one to one. The other thing, that the relatives that remain alive are still in Vietnam. And Which you know that they have a policy of, of not letting the people out. Which brings me to another point. I saw a report uh, on television the other night that you are a heartless creature, in effect. I'm exaggerating, as is my wont. Because of the large number of refugees who might qualify from Cambodia, but you won't let them in because of tuberculosis in the family. Are you planning to slacken the health requirements for immigrants who are refugees? No. No, I think to... That's you know, the first firm answer you give me. No. <laughs> to protect the refugees themselves and the health of the refugees who come here through the process of staging centers and to protect the health of other Canadians. We're going to continue to impose uh, health requirements. Uh, we do have some facilities to assist people with TB in Southeast Asia. And in some cases, we can bring them into quarantine situations in some of the provinces, including British Columbia. But we'll do that only under the safest of conditions. And I think the Canadian people expect nothing less. Back to McClure and his ethnic indigestion. And you, I'm sure you respect McClure like most people in this yes. country do. The reason the Southeast Asian countries don't want to boat people is economic. So he says, make it worthwhile to take these people, North Borneo, Outer Islands of Java, Central America, and give money to these countries to settle them in more suitable climates and easier conditions than attempt to solve it all in Canada's territory. Not, a, not bad, a good plan, plan. Not a bad idea. You know, McClure accepts our 50,000 um, limit, and he said that publicly. Correct. Uh, he also was very influential in, in having the government of Canada make a new commitment to provide food and medical aid to the Campuchian refugees who are starving, as you know. And that's one of the reasons we're not going to go over 50,000 in the near future. That's, that's our limit, and the government has said so. Any future initiatives this year or next year will be in the form of money. Flora MacDonald went down to the United Nations a week ago Monday and pledged uh, $15 million Canadian uh, to assist in food and medical aid to the Campuchians through the Red Cross and UNICEF. That's the sort of thing that Canada can do as well. Are the Campuchians the Cambodians? That's right. That's the new name, Jack, for the Cambodians. Campuchians. Campuchia. Uh, okay, one last uh, bash I must have you on the ethnic balance. You have no figures. For instance, it's, it's claimed that since Trudeau, and remember the caper they had when they opened the doors wide to all kinds of dreadful people from the south who came in and then they got an amnesty. I don't suppose you'd concede that, would you? Well, I don't call them dreadful people. Some of them were a nightmare. Mm -hmm. If you lived in British Columbia, if you were in the drug trade, it was a great thing. Listen, Jack, 7 or 8% of my constituency is from the islands. And they islands. make first class, that's the islands. Caribbean islands. That's what you're talking about. No, I'm not. And they make I'm first class Canadians. About, I'm not, I'm talking about white Americans, mm -hmm. if you want to know the score, when the borders were open white. Not colored people. Mm -hmm. So not being racist in that, okay. one can attack white people. Mm -hmm. You know, especially from the States, we got a real sh bunch of shockers. Uh, is there not a, a, a figure you can give me changing the ethnic balance of this country? Uh, no. Because if I don't ask you these questions, I'm another limp wrist who's afraid to put it to the minister. I we are told that 50% of immigration is third world and many people are reasonably concerned. I don't think there is any conscious policy, nor has there been, to change the ethnic balance of Canada. Not even by the Liberals? No, I wouldn't go so far as is to say that. Is it not a fact that ethnic bloc voting is of extreme importance to governments in a delicate situation? 27 seats, perhaps? I don't think you can ever break it down in that, and for every That's ethnic... That's what Huntington told for me. For any ethnic bloc that goes one way, there's another ethnic bloc that goes the other way. And I don't think you can, you can jigger elections through immigration policy, to put it bluntly. Are we not faced with liberal and conservative governments who are so delicate about bloc voting, which they hope to be able to have some influence on, that that controls part of the immigration policy. No, you get you get block votes if, if such block exists, and I deny that coming from an ethnic constituency, that uh, y you get votes from people based on good government and good policies. If we do a good job in, in, in government in our first four years, we're going to be returned. If we don't, we'll be thrown out. That's the basis of the democratic system. I don't care whether you're black, you're Asian, you're European, you're Jewish, or whatever. That's the basis of people voting in a free democratic system. Did you support the change of Canadian citizenship from five years as a matter of privilege to three years as a matter of right for yes. a passport? Yes, and our party supported it as well. It did? Yes. Except for Huntington. I suppose. 
Did you notice that Mrs. Thatcher has clamped down very much on family reunification and is introducing legislation to stop husbands and wives coming in from the Indian continent? We're uh, looking at that very closely. It's an interesting experiment. She's run into a lot of political flack from within her own party and within her own government. And what I are think you it's looking a, at it? Well, we're going to watch it. We're not going to adopt it holus bolus and, and, and immediately have the problems that she's had. I don't think uh, that that policy is going to be implemented, if you want my honest opinion. If you did it, that would shatter your family class. That's right. So you're just going to observe it? Well, we, there may be some lessons to learn. I have an open mind as a Minister of Immigration and our government has an open mind. We're not socked into family class forever, you know, as an inalienable thing of Canadian law. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly it's an important part of the Immigration Act, which was a very good act, which was passed with all party support in the period 1976 to 78. And right now that is the foundation, the cornerstone of our immigration policy. Ron Atkey, Minister of Employment, mustn't forget the URC regulations and immigration. Mustn't forget Jerusalem and Tel Aviv either. Uh, and then to the phones with the Minister after this commercial break. Um, I want to start riots in the bloody streets. Ron Atkey is the Member of Parliament for St. Paul's, isn't it? That's right, Jack. Very heavily weighted ethnic community. Well, yes, there are a lot of good wasps like you and me, too. Who says I'm a good wasp? Hey, <laughs> eh? Matter of fact, I may be a Mooney for all you know. <laughs> but it is I wouldn't doubtful. bet on it. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on it, no. Would you like to bare your breast and tell us this dreadful mess you got the government into, you and the other fellow, Rob Parker, on... Uh, Convinced twisting George's arm to make the unwise promise to move the Canadian office from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Well, Jack, that was a policy that was in, in discussion among a number of people in the party and in the opposition for, for a considerable period of time before the commitment was made through the election campaign. Did you ask Joe for that commitment? A number of us uh, made representations. You were one and of gave them. Him, I gave him some facts and some submissions, pro and con. We looked at the possibility of the situation. Let me give you a few facts which bore on the situation. First, that uh, almost half the countries in, uh, that are accredited to that country with embassies have their embassies now in Jerusalem. Thirteen have embassies now in Jerusalem, including the Netherlands, including Venezuela, which is an OPEC country. Uh, secondly, the, the, the uh, western part of Jerusalem has been the Israeli capital ever since the country was founded in 1948-49. Uh, thirdly, if the country was to come to Canada, you would expect them to locate their embassy in Ottawa, not in Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal. And, but the main thing was the conclusion of the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. And we thought at the time that, that there was a new climate which would permit the rectification of a historical anomaly, if you will. As it turned out, we were wrong on our time. Very wrong. And I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, but we, did it win you the election, that no, promise? No, it was not a major factor. We did it because we thought it was correcting a historical anomaly and therefore was right as a matter of policy. It was a you very, went, very, very small factor. You in weren't influenced elections. by the, the number of voters who would have liked you for that promise. It was not a large factor, and I think most of the people who, who, who know the constituencies uh, in Toronto with the large view, Jewish vote or in Vancouver and Montreal realize that that was not a big factor at all. Probably the worst boo-boo of your government since you came to power. Oh, well, you can make qualitative judgments. There are all mistakes. Uh, we're human, and we, we do make mistakes. It was a mistaking, mistake, in my, in my view, of, of timing, not of substance. And we've got to give Joe credit for eating crow in a dignified manner and stepping back regardless. I think the Canadian people expect that, and would we take that position? And, and I, I will personally admit that, uh, as a government, we made a mistake, and we did what was right. With Stanfield's report, which was very clear and unequivocal, if you make a mistake, then you backtrack and you say, yeah, I made a mistake. Well, his, his, mista his report actually was quite brutal, wasn't it? It wasn't brutal. It just called a spade a spade. Yeah. Good guy. Now, um, I'll leave it to you to tell me. There is a widespread understanding of the fact that unemployment insurance is now guaranteed social welfare policy of this country. And uh, there's no doubt in my own mind that those who need it don't always get it, and those who can fiddle a system live very well, thank you, by proportion, not a, well, even a small proportion. What are you going to do specifically to get rid of it, of these problems, and to tighten up unemployment insurance? Jack, we're going to try to remove some of the disincentives to work 
some of the things that make it more attractive for people to stay on the pogey rather than to get out and take an honest job and do an honest day. So you're going to cut the rates? Not going to cut the rates, but we may increase the penalties, for example, for people who quit their job voluntarily. I like to compare it to, uh, to, to fire insurance. You know, you put fire insurance on your house and then you go and burn your house down. Should you be allowed to collect fire insurance? I say no. Similarly, if you're fired from your job for misconduct, should you immediately be able to go on unemployment insurance? And I say no, the, the, the penalty provision should be increased. And most of the people in the country seem to agree with me, including the employers and the, employee, and, and, and the employees and their unions. Uh, there are other inequities, some which may cost more money, some which may result in government savings, which we're looking at. Now, when we came into government, we set up a, a task force or a steering, uh, steering group which would look at that, consult with the provinces, consult with the unions, consult with business, who after all pay the premiums. You know, the, 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 the employees and the employers pay more in the UI fund than the I government I seem to have does. had all this before. I seem to have held all this from the Liberals. I seem to have had it from you people in the campaign. You're just going to make it tougher to draw unemployment insurance if you're fired. But the trouble is that many employers, weak-willed, put down a separation other than firing so that people can draw the money. Well, if they do that, they, they, they may be in danger of, of violating the form requirements. You know, there was a report that I tabled in the House uh, from the Auditor General that in 1978, uh, we overpaid people $290 million Correct. in unemployment insurance in, in 1978. Of that, $126 million was attributable to employer error, employers putting the wrong information on the form. And, and that's got to stop. And there was also $78 million of underpayments. 67. 67. Which is equally fire. bad. Equally bad. But the trouble is that the Auditor General finds these things. Your bureaucrats don't seem to be able to find them at all. Well, I have, uh, I've laid down the law. We're going to do a number of things, including the new employer form, including a new report on hiring to, uh, to eliminate employee abuse. Mm -hmm. The guy who goes and gets a new job but still continues to draw a UI, that's a fraud on the public. And, and finally, we're putting in a new computer system, which is going to get the information about when you're in the workforce or not in the workforce <coughs> sooner, so that we've got accurate data and can draw the system accordingly. If I could be given a light-hearted comparison, if they find somebody for fraud after you've laid down the law, they'll send them to jail. Bank robbers will get to 90 days to serve at the weekend. That's how the system of crime and punishment is going. Let's go to the phones to the minister. Mr. Atke, employment and immigration. After the break. Wacko. How long have you been in the House of Commons altogether? Well, six years. Just coming on two years. No, I'm just two years. Yeah, Brand I'm new boy. That's right. Lawyer to trade. That's right. Minister already. That's right. What does that pay? I forget. Well, about sixty-two and change. Nothing like what you were making in private practice as a lawyer. About half. About half. Shh, half. Don't say it. Don't tell anybody. No, <laughs> only the, me and the Department of National Revenue know. <laughs> as long as they know, we're all right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, from Kamloops. Yes. Yeah. Speak up, ma'am. That was just cut off as we started to speak. Yeah, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Speak up, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, uh, to Mr. Atkey, I understand he holds two positions, the Immigration and Employment Minister. I believe that he should uh, just have the one employment, the hold the one position of Employment Minister. I work part-time, four hours a day, and if I have to make 20, work 20 hours before I can get one stamp in my book. And now coming up this week, I can only work four hours, four days, I mean. Mm-hmm. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that a person has to work 20 hours before you can get one stamp in your book. Well, the unemployment insurance uh, scheme, ma'am, is designed to, to provide insurance protection for those who are in full-time in the labor force. And if you're only working four hours uh, in one week, then you're not full-time in the labor force. What she's saying is that if you work at all, you should be able to contribute something. No. You don't agree with that? Hello, no. I work four hours a day, five I days a week, and that'll give me one stamp. That's right. Now, coming this week, I couldn't work yesterday as a holiday, so I only have four days. I work for nothing. 
don't work for nothing, you get paid, but you don't qualify for unemployment insurance for that part week. That's right. We, we determined uh, with the last uh, UI amendment that 20 hours a week was the minimum to show attachment to the labor force. Now, we're going to look at that regulation. It does create hardships in cases like yours, ma'am. There may be another way to do it, but we're certainly not going to, to provide unemployment insurance for, for part-time workers as such, and that's the, 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 the reason for the rule. The rule may be unfair because it's a little rough. We're going to try to get an improvement. Chilliwack, go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Uh, Mr. Atke uh, said a little while ago that the majority of Canadians do not want any more immigration. Webster suggested that might be the feeling. Uh, does that not tell him anything? Hasn't this country always operated on a majority rule? No, well, put it to a question. That's not, he can't, there's nothing there for the minister to answer. What's your question? Well, okay, majority. Canadians don't want immigration. It works about 50-50, according to the Gallup polls that have been taken, that the uh, uh, majority of Canadians who themselves are immigrants uh, sometimes oppose immigration, sometimes want it. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's one of those areas where the, the government has to look at the multiplicity of needs, including demands of the labor market, uh, including the declining birth rate and the fact that we've still got areas of this country that are undeveloped and make a judgment. And if the people uh, don't like our judgment, then you throw us out the next election. Uh, just as I think the, the, the people of Canada had a look at the, some of the decisions made by the previous government last May 22nd, and they made a judgment. But in fact, you would agree with me, would you not, Mr. Atke, that on the face of it, there is virtually not a shred, tittle, or jot of difference between your immigration policy and the Liberal government? I disagree with that, Jack. What's the difference? I disagree with that in the sense we're going to put more emphasis on the independent immigrant, the entrepreneur who can come to this country and make an economic contribution. They started the quarter bit in relation to employment in the country, didn't they? They that, started it. That's right, and of course it's now part of the law, and until we can change the Immigration Act, we are bound by that law. And you want to be bound by that particular We're law. We're looking at it, nothing static in this world. Go ahead, please. Did I understand you to say you have no record of the number of color, colored immigrants coming into the country? We don't keep records by the color of one's skin, sir. Do you keep a record from the country they come from? Yes, we do. And you're waffling on your answer. Not at all. As Mr. Webster pointed out, the immigration from the United Kingdom, some of it's white, some of it's black. We don't know. You have a pretty clear record of what comes from Asian and uh, black countries if you just total the countries they come from. That, uh, that, that information is available, sir, in an annual report I tabled in Parliament, uh, and you can have it. I'll send you a copy if you leave me your address. Just give it. me the figures from it. You don't know. I don't have them on the top of my head. But, uh, Except you must have been asked that question 10,000 times across the country. Yeah, and, I, and, uh, and all I've got is a proportion of the countries uh, where they come from. The largest number of immigrants come from the United Kingdom. The second largest come from the United States. Still not giving an answer. You're that. not going to get an answer, is it? I'll give the answer. I'll send you out a copy of the report. You leave your name and address. Have you, uh, you might have a record uh, of knows what's happened to immigration in the world for our history? The North American Indian. He's finished because of immigration. The Maoris in New Zealand. The Australian Bushmen. Well, Africa. you're drawing a kind of long bow, to even a with a bushman. Color, we get the same thing. We'll be the boat people. To say that you can't ask the question for immigration, to me, is ridiculous. Internally in the country, possibly, <laughs> but not for immigration. You could bring in 20 million Chinese, 20 million Pakistanis, Hindus. They would never even miss them. And we've got two to one colored population. Would you agree with that? No, I wouldn't agree with that, sir. This country... 20 would... million colored to our population. We wouldn't have a... <laughs> One you white? Yep. Against sir, white? sir, this country was built on immigration, and I suspect it will be in the future. Anyway, he represents a popular reaction. I'll tell you that, Mr. Atkin. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Just a second ago, uh, you mentioned that uh, this country has been built by immigration. Well, there is something else about that, and uh, that is that this country has been built by a capitalist system. Now, I have, uh, as probably Mr. Atke has uh, uh, judged that I'm one of the immigrants in this country. So many, many years ago, I immigrated to this country, and I tell you, immigration was different than these days. Today, I, I, I would like to accuse you on that. I would like to say that your immigration department is letting people to immigrate to this country. Go on. I should say that, that your department is telling immigrants of all their rights, not their duties, all their rights. Now, I, 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 I would say as a Canadian that your government has made a decision 
and as an elected government, as a, as a government who's, 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 who's uh, governing this country, I would say that this has been a... Uh, you have made a decision. Uh, no, I, I think I've got your message. He's saying, as many immigrants of years back would say... I would like to, what I would like to say, sir, is that what your government should do is... Hello? Yes, yes. Do finish your sentence. Uh, what, what your government should do is instead of just, just, just giving the immigrants the rights, tell them that they have duties in this country. I've got the point. Yeah, and I agree with the point. I think we can do more in terms of the new arrivals, telling them about this country and the duties of immigrants. And, and to, to the extent through our counseling and our resettlement program we can do that, the gentleman's on to a good thing. Is it brutal to say, though, that uh, come into a country like this or go to a country like Britain or the EEC, Wham, keep your nose clean for three months and you're fully covered by all the social security systems which are available to everyone. And many people of that man's generation, and even my generation, I suppose, think you make it far too easy. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to work anymore. In no time at all, we'll turn the hard-working boat people into Canadian work habits. I don't think so. I, I I'm think not that, that so the, sure. The re reverse, well, I, I, you know, I sincerely pray and hope we don't, otherwise the movement's a failure. If you were in opposition, you'd be saying what I was saying, but now that you're in No, no, no. The opposition are saying quite the reverse. The opposition want to bring in 100,000 boat people. Uh, that's the liberal opposition. That's oh, the liberals and the NDP. You know, they are the opposition, Jack. Nobody, the, the common complaint is that nobody speaks for the ordinary man. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Atkey. Uh, I've been working for two and a half years on this job, and I found it myself, and I was unemployed before this. And now I find out two years after I've been working, unemployment insurance sent me a letter stating that I owe them. $360, and they want paid by the 1st of December, or else they will garnish my wages. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that about $4 million of that mistake was wiped out. How come they're pushing me to this point? Well, why, why do they want the 360 back? Is it they, you were overpaid and you were found out? I'm supposed to be overpaid, $360. Well, and if you're overpaid, you should pay it back, sir. That's public money. On the 1st of December? Well, as soon as you can. Uh, how, much, how much money do you make? I make uh, $7.17 an hour, which is about uh, $1,200 a month. Now, we we'll take this man at face value, Mr. Adke. He's an honest man. He's making money. Mm -hmm. Why can't he make a deal to pay them back at $50 a month? He can. All he has to do is call the local uh, Canada Employment Centre, speak to the official there, speak to the regional offices, and they'll make a deal. If he can't pay it off in one fell swoop, he, he can, uh, they can make an arrangement. Where, That's are you, all... where are you speaking from? I'm speaking from uh, Fort Moody, sir. You phone Murray Perry in Employment and Immigration. Yes. And tell them the minister told you to call yes. and arrange to pay it by installment if you owe the money. They, they offered me that already. Why wouldn't you take it? But the point, my point I'm trying to get at is how come four million dollars of it was, was uh, wiped out that they just forgot about it, they erased it off the books. The, every o claim of overpayment we know about, we, we take steps to enforce it. The Canadian people expect that, and that's what we're going to do. The four million write-off may have been a bureaucratic mistake. It may have been. It may be that we don't know where those overpayments went. We don't know the recipients. If we discover them and we're seeking to do that, sir, we're going to collect. Try $25 a month and so you can have some money left for Christmas. I got, I got two people that I know that were on unemployment insurance about two years ago, and they were still unemployed at the time, and the department told them to forget about it they didn't have to pay it back, and I know these people personally. Well, you tell Murray Perry the same story about that, and we'll go after them as well. Okay, phone Murray Perry, Employment and Immigration. Okay. Murray Perry, and tell him the minister sent you. Okay. Right. More calls to the minister after the break.
Where am I going, Linda? Ron Epke. First time you've seen this face uh, on the Webster Show. We'll be seeing a fair selection of new cabinet ministers, I suppose, during the coming months and years and decades. Go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Pauli, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Zoroastrian Society of British Columbia. Which society? Zoroastrian, Z-O-R-O-A-S-T-R-I-A-N. Isn't that a religion? Yeah, it is a religion. Well, yeah. I doubt very much if you're on the topic. Are you a Zoro Zoro Zoroastrian, Ron? Uh, I don't know much about that religion. Zoroastrian. Mm -hmm. it's, are you on the topic, sir? What's the point? It is in connection, you know, with the Zoroastrian minority community in Iran, sir. You know, that I would like a couple of questions to ask sure. uh, Honorable Red Edke, if it is possible. Go, on, go ahead. Uh -huh. Mr. Edke, uh, the, the, uh, well, uh, um, uh, uh, I have been greatly enthused, you know, and <clears throat> the, to understand that you are going to lose an independent appli uh, 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 applicant, you see. <clears throat> Loosen up the qualifications for independent applicants? Kind of. That, well, uh, is it correct? No, we're not going to loosen up the qualifications. We're going to try to create new opportunities for more independent immigrants to come to Canada. Yeah, that is exactly what I mean. As a matter of fact, sir, I wrote you a letter about two... What's the point, sir? I can't go into the whole history of Zoroastri. No, no, it is not that at all, you know. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it seems, you know, we are going in a, 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 a sort of a vicious circle because independent applicants, you know... <clears throat> Just a moment, please. Is the person from Iran a refugee? Are we taking refugees Not from yet, Iran? not yet. The situation hasn't deteriorated yet, but Have we will. And, and, and it's somewhat difficult for independent applicants from Iran to get here now because of the absence of our security screening uh, 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 officials in, uh, in Iran itself. But we are facilitating through uh, Athens, which is the nearest... Uh, safe uh, Canadian mission to, to, to take independent applications from Iran. Family reunification from Iran is still a, a program that is continuing. You to don't have a refugee program from Iran? Not yet. Can one apply if one gets out of Iran as a refugee to come to Canada? Depends on the cer cer circumstances. It may be under the Refugee Advisory Status Committee procedure that a person can claim refugee status if they are in genuine fear of a political or religious persecution back in Iran. Uh, do you anticipate a large number of Iranian refugees attempting to get into this country? We don't at the present time, but there's always the possibility, and we watch that situation very closely. They don't somehow have the same warmth or compassion about them as the boat people, or do they? Depends. They're very interesting groups. Let me suggest, for example, that uh, the group of Armenian Catholics in, in Iran uh, that we know about, and uh, uh, a group uh, which, which may, may be victimized may, by the present regime, and we're looking at very closely at that particular group. There are other groups as well. The are there Jews in Iran? Uh, the Jewish community in Iran may want to come to, to Canada or North America or Great Britain or other countries. We're watching the situation closely, but right now there doesn't seem to be the necessity. You might need additional refugee quotas on top of your annual allowance. There may be. Obviously, we, uh, we, we are going to take refugees from other parts of the world in Southeast Asia. Right now, we have a quota of 3,000 from Eastern Europe. Victoria, go ahead, please. Victoria. Yeah, hi, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I am um, very, very happy to see um, Mr. Aki on the um, television there. Just a gentleman I want to speak to. Just go ahead. Okay, Mr. Aki. Good morning. Morning to you. Yeah, um, I've got a really personal problem here. Okay, my daughter met a British guy um, about two years ago. Okay, and they were going to get married in February. Unfortunately, he, he's been waiting all this time to qualify for immigration, and he didn't qualify. He was with a friend of his who went through a, a, a was tried under a different section, and uh, they deported him. Mm -hmm. They said to Michael that if he was to continue on trying the case that it, they could possibly deport him to. Did this man come to this country and meet your daughter here? Yes, he did. And are they married now? No, they're not. My daughter is nearly 18. They were going to get married in February. She is my only family here. It's just my daughter and Do I. Do you want her to marry this guy? Because, um, for one reason, he had to go back to Canada, uh, to England. That's great, because he was in violation of his tourist yes. whatever. That's right, but they can get married, and then the situation in terms of his immigration application uh, will change rather drastically, and he can come in as family class. He can. When he reaches a certain age, of course. Can he fly out here, marry out here, and stay as family class? Uh, ultimately, he'll have to go back to England or to another point of entry, say, the United States, and, and make an application and come in. But if he... she flies there and they get married there, can they come back automatically? Sure, not automatically. 
automatically. They have to process, uh, get processed and, uh, and, and pass the health check and the security screening and this sort of thing. If he's got a criminal record, he could be in trouble, for example. But if you pass all those hurdles, he can come in his family class in fairly short order. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Jack. Oh, that reminds me. <coughs> uh, there's a, just, just a second. Galindo Madrid. Did you ever hear that little sure. story? Well, I know Madrid. You do, do you? Oh, yeah, I know that case very well. There's only one reason they should stay in this country now. Do you know what that is? What's that? Sven Robinson made such a fool of him that he might now be in danger if you send him back. Well, there may be an element of truth to that. I, as a matter of fact, just addressed myself to the Madrid case last week. Uh, spoke with Robinson and spoke with another, uh, other MPs who've also made representations. We've decided uh, to, uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the order for deportation on Madrid has to be carried out, but if he leaves uh, voluntarily and complies with the order of deportation and goes down, say, to the United States, he can come back for a period of up to a year, subject to conditions. Uh, the minister's permit, which I'll issue, will allow him to look around for a third country, and we're hopeful that Spain, we're hopeful that Spain will take him, because that's a country where he speaks the same language and he may have an affinity for, what? or another third country, and that in the meantime he stay out of trouble with the law and keep working. Does Madrid know this yet? Yes, he should know it by now. What did you think of Robinson's performance? Bit of a stunt, wasn't it? In making his house a sanctuary for a guy who was under threat of deportation. It was a bit of a stunt, and I found it rather strange behavior on the part of a member of parliament. In fact, he, he camped out in the waiting room of my office and was going to stay there for the whole day unless I met with him personally. I'd given him the answer. I met with uh, Robinson personally and told him the same answer that I'd provided him in Vancouver by letter and through my officials. But I guess different politicians have different styles and different ways of behaving. Does a member of parliament, in case Mr. Robinson's watching, you'll certainly hear if he's not watching. Uh, you're a liar, he's a liar. Does Mr. Robinson, as a member of the Canadian parliament, have any special status powers more than the ordinary citizen whereby he can turn his home into a sanctuary? No. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a stunt. Different it's publicity stunt. Yeah, I think the voters will eventually make a decision. A based on publicity the stunt. The voters may like it, they may not like it. That's part of the democratic system, and uh, as long as Robinson isn't breaking the law, he can do whatever he wants. What about the bleeding hearts who are trying to save Osma Abdel Baki, who was sentenced to seven years in the penitentiary here? Attacked a, an 18 year old Canadian girl with a knife, stabbed her perhaps 20 times. You going to let him stay in the country because he well, now says he's under threat of death in Egypt? Well, my, as you know, my department ordered him deported some years ago, 1974. He's been caught up in the appeal process, the Immigration Appeal Board, and then the federal court. Now the federal court has put it back to the Immigration Appeal Board. I can't really comment, Jack, on oh. the merits of that case because it's before the courts, other than to say that as a, as, a, as a government department, we've made our decision as to what we think of the guy. You want to throw him out? Well, that's, that was the order of deportation, but we are not going to interfere with the judicial process, which is part of our Canadian law, part of our fabric. Can a federal court overrule your uh, arbitrary decisions properly made by you under the law? If the decisions have not followed the law or the decisions of the Immigration Appeal Board have not followed the law, and that's what the federal court said in the Bakke case. You can understand why people look around and they say, what kind of country is this? A guy that's seven years in a bucket, comes out, he's in a $5,000 bond, wandering the streets in the meantime under mandatory supervision, and we can't deport them. Yeah. It is an extreme case, no doubt. Yeah, well, you can't comment on it anyway, because it's before the courts. Perhaps I shouldn't even have raised it, but still, who cares? Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack, and good morning, Mr. Ackie. Good morning to you. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. This is regarding the mobility assistance for somebody that is uh, moving into another uh, town or whatever uh, for uh, for new employment. Now, I've uh, it started uh, on March the 23rd of this year, and I've had uh, complete non-cooperation from uh, even up to the regional court clearance coordinator mm -hmm. for the BC and Yukon. Uh, what happened was. I partic in my particular case, uh, I had to start employment before the application was made for mobility. And I was turned down on the basis, or that basis, because application had to be made and approved before the commencement of employment. Is this correct? Yes, that's usually the procedure. Are you an employer or an employee, sir? Employee. You're an employee. I was an employee. Mm -hmm. y yes, your statement was correct. Now, what's the problem? The, the thing that I'm wondering about, uh, the, to have this uh, appeal go through into, uh, well, it has been to Ottawa, it's been turned down three times,
But the, the situation I'm very concerned with, why does it have to go through Parliament to have uh, the change in the Act? You know, of the, you know, the two, di well, it was uh, two days in my particular case. Yeah, you're getting into the merits of a particular case, sir, that I find it very difficult to discuss in the air. I'd like to hear it in detail, and write to me personally in Ottawa, and we'll have a look at it. No kidding? You will answer it? Yes. Somebody will look at it? Yep. Thank you. Next one. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, good morning, Jack and Mr. Atke. Good morning. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Atke. Uh, why was the uh, time limit for um, citizenship changed from five years to three? Liberals did that. Well, it was felt, and, and I wasn't in Parliament at the time that change went through, it was a year or so ago, was that persons who were in Canada for a minimum of three years, and if they're working, they've acquired the linguistic skills, they have some political knowledge of our Canadian form of government, uh, that they should, f should qualify for the full rights of citizens in that three-year period, and that it doesn't take five years, which it might used to take, uh, because we do a lot, a lot of things now more quickly than we used to. That's the rationale for it, and I'm not either going to defend it or to attack it, because, as, as I said, it was part of a previous Parliament's decision. The good thing it did was it made a number of professional Brits in Victoria take out Canadian passports or not vote in elections. The bad thing, with respect, Mr. Atke, was that Canadian passport is no longer a matter of privilege for which you must qualify, but a matter of right given to you, which the government finds it very difficult to take away. Yes. Too easy to become a Canadian citizen. Do uh, I, uh, I, you, you agree with me, ma'am? Whether you do or not, I'm going to the next call. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Mr. Webster and Mr. Adkey. Yes. Morning. I have a question regarding the length of time it takes to process an unemployment insurance application. I have been in the workforce for a number of years and have never collected unemployment insurance. I'm now off sick due to an operation and have been told it's going to take up to at least five weeks to process my application. And by that time, I have four children who are going to go very hungry because I'm the principal breadwinner in the family. Well, that's uh, an unusually long period of time. I'm surprised that's the situation we do have, of course. Uh, I would suggest that a little short-term loan from your local bank manager might tide you over. Right, because I have doctor's certificates. They've got my record of employment and the whole thing, and all the forms sure. are in. Well, if it's a sure thing, I'm sure your local bank manager will help you out over the four or five-week period. At what percent, uh, Mr. Radke? Yes, I can't 16 afford a loan. half. 17%? Well, I hope it's uh, below that. One only plus a, prime. Only a Tory politician would suggest a loan from your local bank manager. The lady ha asked a very legitimate question. Yeah. What's she going to do in the short term? You gave her a legitimate answer. I gave her answer. a practical solution. Thank you. You and I have to go to the bank, Jack. Well, not me, no, Not sir. you. Not me, sir. Just you. After all, your pay was cut in half when you became a cabinet minister. <laughs> go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Atkey. I, uh, I think that your answers are both uh, not only political but devious. A while back, uh, Mr. Webster had Flora MacDonald uh, on his program, and uh, the question of the numbers of immigrants came up, at which time she said that the figure was set at 100,000 for this year, and as an emergency, uh, an additional 40,000 for... Uh, boat uh, people. The boat people. If you remember, Jack, I wrote you a letter. That's correct. That's what she said at the time. Right. But I'm willing to take Mr. Radsky's... Well, that's some of those 40,000 are in the next year, so that's why it doesn't show up in this year's figures. Well, what is 108,000 this year? About... About 506. Yeah, and maximum event, next I year. I think it's the biggest con that's ever been perpetrated on the Canadian public. That's okay, why. okay, much obliged. Yeah, but, make the figures clear, Jack. About 105,000, 106,000 this year, about 120,000 next year maximum. Plus family class. No, that's 120,000 total. Including family class. Yes. No nonsense. That's correct. No family class beyond 120,000? That's what it will work out to, Jack. It's about 120,000. Well, there is no statutory limit. I mean what I said. I said what I mean, 120,000. That's you your watch. estimate. I'll be that back here at the end of 1980, and you can put me to the test. That is your estimate. That's correct. I mean, the way you say 120,000, no nonsense. That is not the legal limit. That's the projection under the present it, but law. But it is not the legal limit. Yeah, but uh, let's talk in practical terms. That's where we'll end up. Good, but it's not a legal limit. No. Good, I got my no. Um, the man who told us about the income tax fiddle for non-resident dependents, John Ellerton, Chief of Special Investigations, Revenue Canada, Vancouver. Is that not yours, Murray? That's National income Revenue. Tax. Well, I'm Mr. sure. Walter Baker will be out here in the next I'm three sure or four months. Have him on. Your people want to know about it, aren't Sure. They? Yep. Oh, don't you care about it? I sure do. Fiddles? Sure do. 
Okay, they established a few clear points this morning, and, my, and especially good news for Jalindo Madrid. I hope he finds another country. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> but much more so the other gentleman, whom we shall now not name again. My thanks to Ron Atke, Minister of Employment and Immigration. I'll be back after the break. Thanks, sir. Jack, it's been nice. Is my microphone on? No, your microphone's not on. I know that. Hi. Hush, wait. You know, today. What else would you like me to do? Got a brush? Sure. Not bad, thank you, Jack. Jesus, goddamn Christ! Well, you never know. There might be. I'm glad you phoned us, money. The department might want. Uh, I'm back again. The minister's gone. Not bad performance by Ron Atke. They never quite answer questions, as you well know, and you could see for yourself. But I finally got my no on the total numbers of immigrants for next year. And the minister doesn't accept my proposition, of course, that there is the resentment about ethnic integration so widely held and spread rightly or wrongly among the people of British Columbia. I'm just going to clear up a couple of calls before I turn to my guest. Let them have a look at my guest just to see his face. Quite a face, isn't it? Looks like an Old Testament prophet. I'll tell you who he is in a minute. Go ahead, please. Oh, Mr. Jack, good morning, Aki. Uh, I would like to... Mr. Atke has gone. Oh, he has gone? Yes. Oh, I see. So I can't discuss anything about immigration? No, you can tell me what you thought of his performance. Oh, it's okay then, thanks. Thank you. That's good. We'll just try another one. Yes, go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. How are you? Not bad. Uh, reference Mr. Atke, uh, he's gone now. I realize that, but maybe we can talk to you about the subject. We've been trying for about three years to get a young nephew in from England. We've offered him employment, A. We've offered to sponsor him, B. We've offered to give him somewhere to live, C. And he's been turned down three times. We've just applied again, and they told us there's not a hope anywhere of him getting in, but to apply under a new regulation, I don't know whether you know about this one, for family businesses. So we reapplied because he's going to be a family business. Uh, he's going to work for us. But... Uh, you have to be 100% uh, owned by the family. Everybody working for the business has to be... What age is this nephew? He's 21. Uh, there are very few European 100% family-owned businesses in British Columbia, Jack. Are well, you making the point that I was making? If you are under 18, the nephew is not qualified as family class. No, he's, tw he's 21, yeah. Okay, if you're, if you're over 21, you don't qualify. Yeah, I'm not. It's this, it's this new law that, that's getting to me. Uh, you can, if, if you had a corner store and you was a, a, a family corner store, a family business, you could apply for your relative to come anywhere in the world. He doesn't have to uh, uh, get the normal point system to get into Canada. Oh, but it has to be a hundred. Oh, if you've got a little corner grocery store. <laughs> Jack, we haven't got. I get the message. Who's got the corner grocery store? Yes, store? of course. Pardon? Go out and buy a corner grocery store. No, Jack. It's if you're prepared to work 18 hours a day. The immigration is very, is, is very slanted one way in Canada. It's not Mr. Ackie's fault. He didn't put the thing on the books. It was the previous uh, Trudeau government. What I would like to know is who the heck put a law like that on the books? We're going to have thousands of people come into Canada that don't have to qualify for anything. Why didn't you come in before they left? Well, I've been trying for half an hour, but your phone's been busy all this time. You know, uh, we've written to him, we've written to our local MP, we've done all kinds of things. Uh, I don't particularly think that my uh, nephew has is, is got any God-given right to come to Canada. What I say is even Stephen. Uh, we yeah, have fair many Stephen. I, that one sounds as if it's slanted, there's no doubt about it. I'm much obliged. Leave it there. Enough immigration. 
I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me take a break ahead of right time right now so I can start my guest properly and we'll take a longer segment to talk to him. Do you mind doing that, please? I know it's not on the schedule, but would you take a break now? <laughs> Bruce Young is a man of many parts. One of the parts of the family was mayor of Victoria for some time. Mike Young. He's not running again, is he? I don't know. I don't you, keep in touch with his political activities. <laughs> you are a former newspaper reporter. Mm hmm. Is that a call on the Sun? Sun, yeah. Um, a former publisher? Well, I started off as a publisher and I worked my way down. And uh, you brought out a very successful book just recently on labor arbitration decisions in British Columbia. No, in, in, across Canada, it was a study of um, uh, discharge cases uh, um, where, the, where the, the, the grievance went to the arbitrator and I took them and categorized them and, and into the various offenses that people can commit in order to get fired. Like hitting the boss. Hitting the boss. Coming in drunk. Coming in drunk. Dope on the job. Yes, so that's more difficult for them to detect, right? because it doesn't, um, um, uh, they have a little more difficult. Inability to respond to orders. A hazard. A hazard. A hazard. But, that was, but that's a professional book. That's not for public circulation as such. It's for lawyers who do arbitration. Well, it's for people that work, uh, the trade union people that are handling grievances, the, the management people that are, that are um, um, uh, disposing of the, the discipline and... Uh, that's what my, I'm doing a sequel to it now. On Down to the point. Yeah. I was very impressed by a review I saw in an American publication of your book, Hotel California, in which you were claimed to have kind of captured the essence of the crisis facing this continent on energy and other things. Is that not correct? Well, uh, I think that this book addresses itself to energy, but I think that its main function is to point out the error of our ways and that we have... Um, drifted into in our society. You take the, the energy situation as it exists today, and we have all s sorts of proposals. All right, we have to go after what's left, dig up what's left. We've got to go after the coal, the shale, the heavy oils, and get that out of the ground now that we've gone through the readily accessible petroleum. And, uh, or the, the liquid, the easy stuff that pops up so handily What's that we, that, and uh, we're talking now in terms of cleaning up what's left. This is the, the theme that we hear from the oil companies and government and whatever. And w w what we're overlooking is, of course, that of all the resources in the world, the petroleum or the hydrocarbon resources are the most finite of all. We, they go down to a certain level and there they stop. They, I mean, we can probably find iron or platinum or any of these other elements in the way down in the bowels of the earth and that will satisfy the needs of future generations. But once we clean up the hydrocarbons, we're finished because our society, as you must know, has become so um, dependent on petrochemicals. Our agriculture, for example, highly efficient as it may be, would become unable to produce very, very much if it weren't for the petroleum. Now your book, uh, Hotel California, is not surely a, a, a book purely about ecology dealing with the wasteful society, or is it? Well, it points out that, um, that uh, we, ha we cannot continue at the pace we're doing to, uh, I'm not a hardline environmentalist or anything like that, and, uh, but uh, it points out that if we, uh, as a hu the human members of the human race, want to be around for a while longer and we always have these increasing numbers of ourselves that if we want to be around for a while longer then we've got to look at these very finite resources more intelligently we've got to um, we've got to conserve what we have we've got to now this is where the mexico element comes into this book because the mexicans understand this they understand, Jack. You know Mexico well. I know Mexico well, and uh, I've had very favorable reaction to this book from Mexico City. And what's the thesis of the book? The thesis of the book is that the, the, the easiest use to replace the, or, for petroleum is its energy uh, function. The, the petrochemicals that we use in such vast numbers involve 
very much more complex uh, substitutions. We've got other means of, of okay. fueling. Let, let me get you to the point. Yeah. Lazaro Cardenas, patriot and president of Mexico, in 1938 saved his nation's petroleum resource from the greedy multinational oil companies. And Cardenas, who died in 1970, was never to know that his bold action had captured for his country an oil resource equal to that of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And I, w I went down... Was that when they nationalized the American oil companies? 38. 38. British and American. And then recently they made a discovery as great as Saudi Arabia. It could possibly be in excess of... of uh, and what will Mexico do in your thesis that will be different from what wasteful, uh, materialistically ridden North America will do? <laughs> well, they're under terrible pressures to sell their oil to Please. us for as, as, as energy. But the Mexicans themselves are dragging their feet. They've got a quota on their exports. They, they, they have a, I think they've got a longer term view of our role in, on the face of this earth. They Mexicans? See, yes, I'm quite convinced of this. I think that they understand, uh, it became very apparent to me in the reaction I got from Mexico City, they understand um, the, the, the message that I'm saying because they have already, as I put, note in the back of the book, have experienced a, de a civilization which went into a decline. Good. You still got a Scotch accent? Oh, I guess I could have a little bit. You want to try it out? No. No, no all right. Russian, Webster, after the break. <laughs> Bloating, demanding bureaucracy. Yes, and oh, it got book. Bruce Young has written a non-fiction book warning us about the potential consequences of our energy behavior on this continent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the collapse of the Mayan civilization in the Yucatan Peninsula. They're a kind of glamorous people who always in, in, intrigued me a bit. Yes, well, of course, the Maya were the, were the most advanced of all the indigenous civilizations in, in the Americas. But uh, uh, many people don't realize is that a few years before Columbus came, their society collapsed on its own accord. And if you uh, read about the Maya, you will just, and, or, and do as I did, which was go, go down and visit their ancient cities, and they've, they had some magnificent cities, Jack. The Tikal in Guatemala is one of the most magnificent towns, and it's been partially restored They've got a sense of space, and, and their, their structures are so dramatic. Uh, they make our cities look a little bit junky. And Why uh, did the civilization collapse pre-Columbus? Well, what happened was, of course, that they, they, they became established on this, this uh, sort of um, very sort of thinly layered uh, topsoil on that, in that area. Underneath is limestone. And it was very easy to grow the basic corn that uh, supported them and of course this left people free to pursue other lines of an endeavor. They built up a bureaucracy of course, they built up a scientific community, they built up an educational uh, system, they have, of course had a military establishment and as long as the corn kept on coming off the fields this society grew and prospered. But unfortunately their methods were Lack, they lacked foresight because they would go out and they'd clear a piece of jungle by burning, great, get a great crop off it the first year, second year half the crop because the weeds started taking off over, third year abandoned it, moved on to the next. That land being so thinly layered with soil never became productive again and of course when the land ran out the food supply dried up and uh, people, dissent started to enter into the society. People wondered why they were spending all this time paying taxes to the, to the, uh, uh, to the theocratic government that they had. And uh, you can go down to the Yucatan, as I have, and you'll see the scars that have been uh, put on the, on the carvings of some of the leaders. You know, you can see that the, the, there's been obvious agitation about this, building these monuments. And it collapsed. That, and it collapsed. Pre-Columbia. Pre-Columbus. Pre yes, Pre-Columbus. Yes, yes, all on its own. It might, might be a microcosm, if that's the right word, a uh, sample, 
of what can happen to any highly sophisticated society that doesn't look after its resources. That, exactly. The, the, the parallels are rather frightening. Okay, now tell me about Cardenas. Oh, well, I... Uh, who's the Mexican now? Who's the president now? Echeverria? No, 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 he's gone. He was a bit of a disaster. He was in the sort of the... Who is it now? Free Lopez Portillo. Portillo, Echeverria, Echeverria, and then... No, Cardenas was president back in the late 30s. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he died in 1970. And in the course of preparing this book, I went to Mexico City to interview his son. And uh, he told me the story. At that time, the, the oil workers of Mexico were on strike. And their main demand was that they be treated somewhat equally to those uh, imported uh, American and British employees of the same Companies. company. And the dispute went to arbitration. Uh, and the settlement of a package of 26 million pesos, which at that time was worth $13 million, mm -hmm. uh, what was uh, was ratified by the Supreme Court of Mexico at, of Mexico and this uh, um, settlement uh, the the oil companies refused to accept and uh, Cardenas himself who was a great president a great Democrat uh, took on the oil companies and he met this Van Hasselt who was the president of the Shell oil subsidiary in Mexico the leading producer and Cardenas said to him, he said, well, this is the story I get from the son. Uh, he said, well, why don't you pay them the 26 million pesos? Get them and back they, to they, they said, we're not going beyond 24 million pesos. And he said, why? He said, because the, the Van Hassel said, if we give them the more, they'll just ask for more again. And there'll be no end to it. So our line is 24 million. And the president turned turned around and he said to the Van Hasselt, he said, you have my guarantee that they will not ask for any more than the 26 million peso package. And Van Hasselt then turned around with incredible arrogance and said, and who guarantees you? Jesus. And not more than a few days later, the president of Mexico was on the radio to announce that the lands, the oil lands and the properties and had the been, equipment and the whole thing had been expropriated by the Mexican government. By the Mexican government. God bless Cardenas. <laughs> hey. Well, I don't know. He certainly that's the reason why Mexico hasn't been sucked dry of oil. Uh, is that the, is that it fell into Can the? Can you see Joe Clark say that to the Shell Oil or Esso or anybody else saying you I would, stop? I, I I I don't know. I wonder if Esso would turn around to uh, Joe Clark and say, "And who guarantees you?" They would most definitely and most certainly. That's a great story. <laughs> yes, it's a you know, I always thing. admired the, the Mexico for standing up on the knees at a bad time from the knees in 1938 and saying, "Terrible! It's time. our oil. It's, these are our fields." We shall take them for the people of Mexico. Because throughout the world, they were castigated as the worst kind of communist government for doing that. Yes, and uh, the only thing that saved them, actually, was the fact that Franklin Roosevelt was president of the United States. They would have invaded. Uh, the British wanted to invade Mexico. Over. They were very annoyed and, because they had the substantial holdings Why there. Why the British can sure be stupid on occasions, I'll tell you they're, that. They're Bruce Young, look, it's nonfiction. I Nothing. like the sound of it. I might even read it. All right, you go ahead. And my thanks to Bruce Young. Thank of you, the Jack. Good, Yeah, good, no, 975. Well, it costs a lot to print these things these days, you know. I my thanks I, to Bruce Young. Don't uh, touch your beard. It looks fantastic. Okay. After the break. <laughs> we tape it. Thank you very Appreciate much for coming that. out this morning. Very right. Careful. Regards to all the youngs that are still around. Okay. Very difficult. Yeah. yeah. I find my grandchildren difficult to take. <laughs> I suppose Morning, they might Peter. feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Jack. Thank you very much, Bruce. I'm very grateful. What's that up? Uh, very pretty this morning. Confirmed. Okay. We'll go for it anyway. Confirmed. I'll tell you in a minute.
It's the my, language. Uh, I thought the Atkin thing was quite good fun this morning. Yeah, went well. Great city. Bruchang, good too. Now, tomorrow? Rentlesman. Jim Patterson. Right. It's about time we did something detailed for you on Rentlesman because of the incredible changes there are. And I've had a few queries lately. So we're going to have an exploratory informative program with Jim Patterson, the Rentlesman for British Columbia, tomorrow morning. Anything else firmly scheduled? Maybe Langley School Board. Both sides. Both sides. Mm. 9 a.m. tomorrow, precisely.